Shri Gurave Namaha Vanchakaupa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So we welcome everyone to our ongoing study of the Bhagavad Gita as it is at the level of Bhakti Shastri. And uh, today's lesson number four, right? Yes, Radha. So, is everyone able to see the PowerPoint? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, yes, Maharaj. good. So, we're on lesson four, and the title of the lesson today, Contents of the Gita Summarized. In other words, it's the title of the second chapter. So, we're going to look at the features of the second chapter. First of all, a quick review of what we covered yesterday. We did speak about the principles of Varnashram Dharma. We explained how Varnashram Dharma helps to organize the society, organize the, the people so that they can all cooperate together for each other's welfare, both material and spiritual. And we spent a little time talking about Arjuna's reasons for not fighting according to the principles of Varnashram Dharma. That Arjuna was pr talking particularly about com compassion, which is really Brahminical quality. It's not the principle of the Kshatriya. Then we spoke about Arjuna's surrender to Krishna. And we heard from you all different points which are relevant to our own practice of Krishna consciousness, that we need to surrender to a representative of Krishna and we should appreciate our need to be guided by someone, that we also become confused often about how to practice the principles of religion. So having a spiritual authority is very helpful in that process. And Arjuna understood that. Okay, before we go on, okay, okay, right? So, Dharma Samuda, meaning? Dharma Samuda, what's the meaning? Uh, yeah, maybe one person could tell me. What is confused, it? Uh, confused about duty, Maharaj. Confused about their duty, about their actual application of the religious principles. All right, and here's Arjuna's five reasons for not fighting. And we're going to see how Krishna takes these different reasons apart in the course of chapter two as well as chapter three. We'll hear Arjuna arguments be defeated by Lord Krishna. Right? First of all, 
Arjuna's first argument was compassion. So, Lord Krishna deals with this by presenting the knowledge of, well, just simply knowledge, jnana. He presents the knowledge of the difference between the body and the soul. And so we have text 11, up all the way up to... Excuse me, Prabhuji, there's a... Maharaj, there's an echo. There's an echo in the back. Well, there's no echo on my side. There's echo when you spoke. But when I'm speaking, I'm not hearing any echo. Are you hearing echo from me? Uh, no, Maharaj. No, Maharaj. No, Maharaj is all good. No, Maharaj. But some of you no, have echo. Some of you do have echo. Purnima, Mataji, I would suggest just take your speakers. Can I continue? Yes, yes, Maharaj, please. All right, so the, the knowledge of the difference between the body and the soul is presented by Lord Krishna in these verses here in the second chapter, text, from text 11 all the way up to text number 30. Lord Krishna highlights the difference between the body and the soul. Now this is something which is very basic and fundamental in spiritual knowledge. Krishna, right? Okay. Can you see the illustration? Yes, Maharaj. What's happening? Somebody would somebody like to tell me who's uh, maybe one person can tell me. What's being, what's the example which is being shown here in the illustration? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Oh. Maharaj, the person is trying to rescue the drowning man by removing, by pulling out his clothes. Yes, can you, can you relate it to uh, the knowledge of Bhagavad Gita? Yeah, actually, Baba. We should not be too much concerned about our body, which is the outward dress. We should concern for our soul only. Right. Do you know the verse in the Bhagavad Gita where Krishna compares the body to the dress? Yes, that's right. Yes, go ahead, say the verse. Mm -hmm. Yes, and the translation? As a new, as a, as a person puts a new a garment, uh, throwing away his own garment. Similarly, the, uh, the conditioned soul uh, puts on a uh, new body, uh, discarding his old and unuseful bodies. All right. Thank you. Yes, good. So this is spiritual knowledge. This is what we would call Atmatattva, the science of the soul that the body is eternal, uh, rather the soul is eternal and the body is temporary, the bo body is likened to a dress. Uh, Lord Krishna actually begins his, this section on Gyan by telling us about the soul. He describes the changing of the body, right? How the body changes in the course of one life. Who would like to tell me that verse. Yes? Someone? Yes, very good. And do you know the translation, Prabhu? Uh, I have to exact translation, Maharaj. Well, roughly, the meaning. Okay. So, 
as the embodied uh, person changes the cloth uh, no, sorry from boyhood to youth similarly when the uh, soul passes away from one body it goes into another body uh, but the sober person uh, doesn't get bewildered by such change ah yes right the sober person is not bewildered by the change of the body so one who is in knowledge one who has this gyan he understands the body is changing it's a body becoming old the body dies but the soul doesn't die who knows the verse where lord krishna describes that the soul doesn't die jayate mriyate va kadachan nayam bhutva bhavita vana bhuyaha ajo nityah shashvato ayam purano na hanyate hanyamane sharire Yes, do you know the translation, Madhuji? Uh, Maharaj, I think uh, the soul is eternal, primeval, and uh, ever-existing. And um, not exactly, Maharaj. Only I mean that. Well, na jayate, mriyate, vakadachin. What is Krishna saying? You can understand the meaning. There is no death or birth for the soul at any time. Yes. Nayam budva bhavita vana bhavita. Ajo nityam shasvato yam purano nahanyate hanyamane sharire. He's, 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 not, he's not slain when the body when is the body slain, is right? Yes. He's unborn. He's eternal. ever existing and prime evil so this is there there is another verse also which tells us about the qualities of the soul because there are different weapons which are sometimes used in fighting different astras so one may wonder is there any weapon which can destroy the soul ट्रांसलेशन The soul can never be cut to pieces by any weapon, nor burdened by fire, nor moistened by water, nor withered by the wind. Right. So different weapons, the the fire weapon or the wind weapon or whatever weapon, the knife, they they cannot harm the soul. Why not? Why can the soul not be harmed by these weapons? Hare Krishna, Guru uh, Maharaj. Uh, because soul size is too small, it is uh, just uh, uh, tip of the hair, one about uh, one by one uh, ten thousand parts. So it is too small, even the atomic uh, molecular atoms also smaller than that also. So. well it cannot be okay it's very small but could we not burn it no it cannot be burned why not because it is eternal ah yes because it's eternal and that is the nature of spirit right it's spiritual the soul is spiritual energy and spiritual energy what's the nature of spiritual energy the nature of spiritual energy is everlasting yes eternal it's eternal full of full of knowledge and bliss yes such a dananda right the nature of the soul is eternal full of knowledge but the body what's the nature of the body 
body is slain temporary huh the body is what slain the body is temporary well it may be slain not everybody's go going to be slain but everyone's going to die right everyone has to die one krishna says for one who takes birth something what is certain death is yes certain. one who takes birth death is certain right so you take we've all taken birth in this world and so our death is also certain because we took birth we will have to also die give up the body we took we accepted the body and we'll give up the body so death is simply giving up the body it's not something which we have to really be very worried about it's just simply a change of body so this is knowledge this is gyan this is the atma tattva the science of the soul why is krishna presenting this knowledge someone Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, because uh, Arjuna should be composed and not thinking uh, of like uh, doing uh, not not doing war. He 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 is getting. He should be encouraged. Arjuna should be encouraged. He should be encouraged to fight, right? Yeah. He is just doing uh, as per Krishna's wish because uh, that's why he is saying, "Oh, now you are just an instrument or doing the lila." Everything is already uh, Krishna knowing everything. Ah, uh -huh. but uh, Arjuna, Arjuna, Arjuna's reason for not fighting, he he thinks it's not good that he should go and kill people who are worthy of his worship, superiors like Bhishma and Drona, and Arjuna was arguing that how can I kill people who are worthy of my worship? And so Lord Krishna. is presenting the knowledge of the soul to explain to just to confirm of course arjuna knows this but still krishna is making the point again he wants to remind arjuna that you're not going to kill the soul arjuna you're only going to kill the body and the body is going to die one day anyway so why are you worried Where, why be compassionate? Hmm. And that's how, if you look at the text, if you look beginning text number eleven, here in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna begins because Lord Krishna is taking the position of the teacher. Arjuna had requested him, "I'm I'm going to become your disciple. Please instruct me." So Krishna took the position of the teacher, and he immediately. chastised him and told him while 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 speaking learned words o arjuna you are mourning for what is not worthy of grief those who are wise lament neither for the living nor the dead hmm? so arjuna was chastised by lord krishna he said your compassion 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 for the, the the body that is foolish that is ignorance to show compassion on the body real compassion is based on the soul now a lot of uh, welfare activities are all based on the body welfare activities people say oh we should feed the poor oh we should uh, give uh, charity and help the underprivileged the orphans and you know, so many different welfare activities are going on and they're all concerned with the body so that is material compassion but that is not going to solve the problem of life The real problem of life is that people have taken birth in the material world. They have a material body. So compassion is a good quality, but we have to know how to use compassion. Compassion should be placed 
for the soul, not for the body. How will we show compassion for the soul? Someone? By giving Krishna consciousness, by giving them knowledge of the soul. Okay. How are you going to do that? Through preaching, Maharaj. Like we are not this body, we are the soul. Okay. Is that the only way you're going to show compassion on people, just by your preaching? Uh, make him how aware that, uh, now like uh, this, uh, this, uh, like, uh, now like problems is going to come and go. He has to actually understand the nature of this. Well, you know, not everyone will be able to understand these things and to appreciate these things, but we can yeah. still show compassion on them in other ways. By giving prasadam. Yes, right. By giving prasadam and also yeah. by... Also by... Not only prasadam, what else do you want to give? Telling them to do Harinam. Yeah, giving the holy name. Holy name. Let them hear the holy name, the chanting of the holy names. It's very important. So those two things, we distribute the holy name and spiritual foodstuffs. That does help to uh, alleviate them from their unfortunate conditions, makes them a little fortunate. So that is, that is real compassion, compassion based on the soul, spiritual activity. But this kind of compassion, it's like saving the, saving the shirt of the drowning man. That is like material compassion, compassion based on the body. You may feed people today, but they'll be hungry tomorrow. You're not really solving the problem. You just feed people. How, are you going to feed them every day? That's difficult. How many people can you feed? So how, much, how can you show compassion? But if we do service to Krishna, that is for the benefit of all living entities. We cannot show compassion to many people. We cannot feed many people. We try to feed as many as we can, but our service will always be limited. But if we can do service to Lord Krishna, that, that is the highest compassion. And that's for the benefit of all living entities everywhere. All right? Are there any questions on this so far? about Krishna defeating Arjuna's argument based on compassion? Everyone's clear? You understand compassion now? Yes, yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. And you understand why Krishna's yes, chest... You understand yes, why Krishna's yes, chest... Yes, okay, okay. <laughs> Krishna, Krishna's... Yes, Maharaj. <laughs> Krishna's chastising Arjuna. Your compassion, you're mourning for what is not worthy of grief. Because everyone's going to die, the body's going to die anyway. But we want to uh, understand the nature of the soul. How to give greatest benefit to the soul, to help the soul. The soul is not going to die, that's important. So this is Gyan, this is the knowledge which is given, shown here, Najayate Mriyate Vakadachin, for the soul, there is neither birth nor death at any time. You know, Prabhupada had very nice ways of introducing this philosophy to people. Uh, sometimes people would come to Prabhupada and they would ask him, Swamiji, how old are you? And Prabhupada would look at them in the eyes and say, I am the same age as you. And they would be shocked. You know, they would be really shocked that, oh, you're the same age as me? How could it be? You know, you look like an old man and, you know, I'm only 25 or something. <laughs> but Prabhupada was bringing them to the spiritual platform. He would say, I'm the same age as you. I am a soul. You are a soul also. 
Now my body may be very old, but when I was 21, where were you? You were in an old body. Now you're thinking you're young. You're thinking you're young today, but when I was young, where were you? You were in another body. You were old. <laughs> so Prabhupada would speak to people like this and bring them to the spiritual platform. Can you understand these points? I hope so. They're very powerful. It's very effective to preach to people in ways like this and help them to understand our actual identity as spiritual beings. That we're not simply bodies, but we are all souls. We are pure souls. Okay, we'll go ahead. Thank you, so Maharaj. I had a doubt. You have a doubt? Yes, Maharaj. Yes. Uh, Maharaj, uh, so Krishna says that the, only the body is being affected and not the soul. So, Maharaj, uh, what if someone uses this as a justification for violent actions or murder? Like, I'm only, I'm only hurting the body but not the soul. So, how do you understand this, Maharaj? Well, we understand that the body is given to us by Lord Krishna and it has to be used for the service of Krishna. So if you do violence, if you do harm to the bodies which are given to living entities under the arrangement of Krishna, it is not in cooperation with Lord Krishna's plan. Lord Krishna has given every living entity their different bodies according to their karma, according to their past deeds. They're awarded, into, they're placed in different kinds of bodies. And it's uh, required that we have to, un we have to go through the, the duration of life, the appropriate duration of life which is required in that body. You know, someone takes birth maybe in the body of a tree, they have to live in the body of a tree for some time. And then somebody else takes birth in the body of a little insect and they will spend a very short time in that body because the duration of life is not very long. And then gradually the soul will come to the human body. And so the, the law of nature is there, that living entities take birth and they go through changes, right? Do you know the changes which the body goes through from birth to death, what else happens? The different changes? The body, the body takes birth and then someone, one person answer. Maharaj, Maharaj, the body takes birth, it grows, then it stays, it propagates, it stays for some time, it dwindles. And it dies. Yes, it produces by it grows, it maintains, it produces byproducts, and then it dwindles and dies. Right? These are the different changes which all different living entities go through: the human beings, the plants, the fish, the birds, everyone. And so we have to respect the body which is given by the grace of Krishna, and we shouldn't do harm to that body. We should, you know, generally uh, take care of all living entities, respect them, give them the opportunity to finish their time in that body. So that's Vaishnava quality. We're com we're com we have compassion on all living entities. So if you go around killing living entities, then they have to take birth again. They have to come back again and take birth again in that body because they didn't finish their time. They didn't finish their allotted karma in that body. So that kind of behavior is not approved by Shastra. Is that all right? You understand? Yes, my much. Thank you. Okay. Dhruvam Janmam Ritashyacha. For one who has taken birth, death is certain. Jatashyahi dhruvam mrityu dhruvam janma mritashya cha. Bhagavad Gita 2.27. Hmm? 
one who has taken birth, death is set. And for one who is dead, he will take birth again. So we should not disturb them. From the purport of text 18 in the second chapter, from both viewpoints, there is no cause of lamentation because the living entity, as he is, as he is cannot be killed, nor can the material body be saved for any length of time or permanently protected. So no cause of lamentation. We don't need to lament. Why? Because the soul is not going to be killed cannot be killed, and the material body cannot be saved. You cannot expect a material body to live forever. It has to go, it has to die sometime. So there's, there's no cause to lament when we give up the material body. It's just a change of body. All right, so this is Gyan, this is the knowledge of the soul, the difference between the body and the soul. And our, Lord Krishna is presenting all of this knowledge to defeat Arjuna's compassion, Arjuna's thinking by not fighting, by not killing, he's being compassionate. But Krishna said, your, your words, you're speaking learned words, but you're mourning for what is not worthy of grief. Those who are wise do not lament for the living or the dead. Okay, now next argument Arjuna had, enjoyment. Arjuna was concerned, I won't enjoy. Therefore, Lord Krishna presents the teaching of karmakanda, the path of fruit of work. Karmakanda, right? Enjo the path of karma, the path of activities to enjoy the results of our work. You know, you get brahmanas. Some brahmanas are karmakandi brahmanas. They do rituals for people so that they can have good results, you know. Someone wants to make money. A young girl wants to find a nice husband. They'll do these different kind of rituals. A couple want a child. They'll do karmakandi activities. They'll go to the karmakandi priest to perform some rituals for their, for their benefit for their material enjoyment. This is karmakanda. So 237 from Bhagavad Gita, O son of Kunti, either you will be killed on the battlefield and attain the heavenly planets, or you will conquer and enjoy the earthly kingdom. This is uh, Lord Krishna's argument to Arjuna. Look, Arjuna was thinking he shouldn't fight, but Krishna says, well, if you fight, either you'll be killed on the battlefield, and then you will go to the heavenly planets, and if you're not killed on the battlefield, you'll win the battle, you'll conquer, you will enjoy the earthly kingdom. So both ways you will enjoy, but if you don't fight, what will happen? Someone answer? If we don't, if Arjuna doesn't fight, what will happen? Krishna Maharaj, uh, Arjuna will um, lose his face. People will uh, criticize him, saying that he was cowardly. He ran away from battle. Also, he might get sinned because he did not perform his duty. Oh yes, very good. Thank you. That's very correct. Mm. Arjuna would be. His name would be ruined. And, for, and because one who you've been honored in the past, for one who has been honored, dishonor is dishonor is worse than death. So it's better for Arjuna to fight rather than to be dishonored, to be put to shame, to be called a coward. It would be very painful for him. People, people wouldn't say, oh, Arjuna was so noble, he didn't fight. They would just say, no, he was a coward. He was afraid to fight. Okay, from, then from text uh, 34 to 36, people will always speak of your infamy 
And for a respectable person, dishonor is worse than death. What could be more painful for you? Mm, very painful to be dishonored. After being honored, Arjuna was honored. Of course, he was known as a great warrior, a great Kshatriya, a Maharati. And then if he's not going to fight, then he will really be put into disgrace. Nobody will respect him. It will be very painful for him. So the, the path of Karma Kanda is that if Arjuna fights, he can enjoy. Because Arjuna was saying, if I, 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 he was thinking, if I fight, I won't enjoy. But Lord Krishna turns it around and said, no, if you don't fight, you won't enjoy. If you don't fight, you will suffer. You will suffer so much pain, mental agonies, the dishonor will be very painful to you. But if you do fight, win or lose, you will enjoy. So this is karma kanda. We, person wants to enjoy. You're doing something you want to enjoy. And then, oh, okay, 232, from 232, Swarga Dwaram Apavritam. Open the doors to heaven, right? O Partha, happy are the Kshatriya to whom such fighting opportunities come unsought, opening for them the doors of the heavenly planets. Does, does a devotee want to go to heaven? No, Maharaj. No, Maharaj. Are you sure? Yes, Maharaj. Yes. yes, Maharaj. Well, for the service of Krishna, devotee can go anywhere, right? But it's not that we want to go to heaven just for the sake of enjoyment. But that's what's being described here. At this, at this point, Krishna is speaking on, about, uh, on the level of karma kanda. Later on, Krishna will bring the argument to a higher level and he will explain about karma yoga. But just by way of introducing the topic, he's explaining karma kanda. Now, karma kanda is not a spiritual activity. It's a material activity. Materialistic people perform karma kandi activities. You'll probably know the eighth offense in chanting Hare Krishna Right? Do you say the ten offences every morning? Anyone know the eighth offence in chanting Hare Krishna? Uh, Maharaj, I'll try um, to consider the chanting of the Holy Name to be one of the auspicious ritualistic activities as uh, stated in the Vedas known as fruitive activities of Karma Kanda. Okay, very good. Yes, right. That's right. If we think chanting Hare Krishna is just like a Karma Kandi activity, then that is offensive chanting. We don't chant Hare Krishna just to get material benefits. In the same way, Arjuna is not really interested in opening the doors of the heavenly planets. But Lord Krishna is presenting it to him in this way. He said, Kshatriyas are happy for this. <laughs> Kshatriyas come to fight. They're happy for that opportunity. Text 33 from the Bhagavad Gita. If, however, you do not perform your religious duty of fighting, then you will certainly incur sins for neglecting your duties. Okay, so fighting is a religious duty. For the Kshatriya, it's a religious duty. We have to understand this. Don't think of the fighting in, as we would think today, Kali Yuga. Today, of course, there's no real Kshatriyas. One morning, Prabhupada was on the walk in the park, and there was this big bronze statue of some Vikings. And they asked Prabhupada, you know the Vikings from Northern Europe? And they, they asked Prabhupada, were, were they Kshatriyas, Prabhupada? 
And Prabhupada said, no. <laughs> he said, they were demons. And, and then they asked Prabhupada about when, when there's fighting, wars, different countries fighting each other. He said, are these kshatriyas? He said, no. He said, they're demons. And they go to hell, both sides. Both sides fighting. And so it's not the business of devotees to get involved in these kind of things. And certainly we, uh, we don't think of fighting as a religious duty. Another statement from the Purport, text 35. If he abandons the battle, not only would he neglect his specific duty as a Kshatriya, but he would lose all his fame and good name and thus prepare the royal road to hell. In other words, he would go to hell, not by fighting, but by withdrawing from battle. So he, by giving up his duty, then he goes to hell. And it's a very precarious situation. So we, we have to be cautious. You're going to do so, you take up some duty, you have a duty, you have to perform your duty. Uh, Prabhupada tells a story here about this, about highlighting the spirit of the Kshatriya. And he tells about a Kshatriya king called Yashumanta Sen. And Prabhupada said, Yashumanta Sen, either he conquers the battle or he lays down his body there, dead. So the man who has come, <laughs> oh, so Prabhupada was telling the story, it's not so much here, I don't know what happened to the... Uh, nah. This Yashomanta Sen, he went to battle and he was defeated in the battle. So after the battle was over, he, he came home alone without his army because they were all defeated. But somehow he didn't die and he came home. But when he came back to his palace, the, the doors were all locked. So he called to the, the queen inside the palace and he said, I'm, I'm your husband, I've come home. I've lost the battle and I've come home. But the queen who was inside the palace, she said, oh no, my husband wouldn't come home defeated. Either he will die on the battlefield or he will, come, he will be victorious, but he, he cannot come home defeated. So the queen said, you must be a pretender, you must be someone else. So she would not open the door. <laughs> so Prabhupada said, this, this is the spirit of the Kshatriya. In the palace in Jaipur, you know the Jaipur kings, they were great Kshatriya warriors. And that's why Govindaji was taken to Jaipur and other deities also were brought from Jaipur to, uh, from Vrindavan to Jaipur. You have Radha Damodar there and Radha Gopinath there in Jaipur as well as Radha Govinda. So the, there's a painting there in the palace in Jaipur, the Kshatriyas are fighting and the sword is inside one man, the other man fighting the, shat, the king and you can see that the sword had entered into the body of the one man. But the other man was fighting, he was pulling the man closer to him so he could hit him. And so he, although his, the, the man's sword was already in his stomach, the man was pulling the man closer because he wanted to fight back. And Prabhupada said, yeah, this is the spirit of the Kshatriya, that they, they want to die on the battlefield and they will die going forward. They cannot be killed on the back. To be killed, if they're killed laying on their back, that's very disgraceful. They must be killed going forward. They have to go forward. They have to fight going forward. To be killed retreating, that's a disgrace. Kshatriyas don't want that kind of death. 
uh, I think it's in Srimad Bhagavatam, it's mentioned there are two, two kinds of death which are glorious. I think in relation to Vritasura, two, two kinds of death are glorious. One is on the battlefield and the other is in Samadhi. Okay? So the spirit of the Kshatriya. So compassion, Arjuna's argument of compassion has been defeated in texts 11 to number 30 where Krishna presented the knowledge of the soul and the difference between the body and the soul. And then Arjuna was worried about enjoyment and sinful reactions and Krishna presented Karmakanda. He presented the knowledge of Karmakanda that you will enjoy and the sinful reactions, sinful reactions will come if you don't do your duty. But if you do your duty, then there will be no sinful reactions. You perform, one should perform his duty and that way there's no sinful reactions. So these two arguments have been defeated in the second chapter. Would someone like to read here? Yes, Guru Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Both ways you have to fight. Krishna is trying to put Arjuna in, in the dilemma. This way or that way you must have to fight. If you think that you are not the in bodily concept of life, then it's my order. You must fight. If you think that you are in bodily concept of life, then you are a Kshatriya. You must fight. Both ways you have to fight. This is Krishna, Krishna's conclusion. Hare Krishna. All right. So, first of all, Lord uh, Prabhupada is explaining both ways. The first way is you're not in the bodily concept of life. So, why do you have to fight? Can you explain? You must have to fight. If you think you're not in bodily concept of life, you must have to fight. Then it is my order. What, what does it mean? Why does Arjuna have to fight if he's not in the bodily concept of life? Please explain. Madhiji. So in both the ways, um... No, not both the ways, the first way. You're not in bodily concept of life. You have to fight. Yeah, in bodily concept of life as uh, uh, Krishna confuted with the, counteracted with the Gyan uh, um, uh, verses where he said that we are uh, not body, we are soul. So in that... Uh, Pertaining to that, we have to fight for as a Kshatriya, Arjuna has to fight following his dharma. Right. Because it's not the, if you think you are not in bodily concept of life, then it means you understand you're a soul. So there's no question of the soul being killed. So there's no reason for you not to fight. Right? You have to fight because the soul is not going to be killed. The soul cannot be killed. So you should fight. And if you are in the bodily concept of life, then you're a Kshatriya, you must fight. Why? This is the service uh, given by uh, Krishna. It's As a Kshatriya, one has to fight, otherwise yes. they will be... Yes, the duty of the Kshatriya. His duty is come to fight. You have to fight. Yes, so both ways you have to fight. If you're the body, you have to fight. If you're not the body, you still have to fight. Okay. So the path of karma kanda. We see how it's described here in these ver this verse here in Bhagavad Gita. Someone like to read, read this to verse this verse in translation for me, please. 
words of the vedas likened to flowers hari krishna pranam maharaj i heard my mother say that uh, words of the uh, uh, the vedas are flowery because to attract people to learning vedas that is why to attract people to learn the vedas well but uh, uh, we have to understand also the nature of flowers right you say to attract people yes will attract people but what is the nature of the flowers do they have a long life they don't have long life right they very quickly dry up they wither right and they fall apart and do they look very beautiful when they're old and dried up they don't look they're not so attractive anymore are they no so the the words of the vedas are like that and they offer results which are very temporary and limited but people of small knowledge are attracted to them they're thinking this is this is very good they're thinking oh heavenly planets good birth power and this is common people are attracted to these things so the vedas offer that kind of incentive to people they want material enjoyment but it's like flowers very temporary okay and Yes. Read this verse. Someone? Sunanda Prabhu. Sunanda Prabhu. Prabhu ji, you are not audio. Hare Krishna Prabhu, you are not audio. Sunanda Prabhu. ियल ने O Arjuna, become transcendental to these three modes. Bhagavad Gita, two point four five. Thank you, thank you. Yes. So the Vedas, people like to follow the Vedas, but here Lord Krishna is advising Arjuna, become transcendental to these Vedas because the Vedas are dealing with the three modes, the three modes of material nature. So. if we are in the modes of nature sometimes we may be in goodness other times we may be influenced by passion and ignorance there's always a struggle for competition between the modes we want to rise above the modes lord krishna is telling arjuna become transcendental to these modes Okay here's a exercise for for us. how many people do we have here this afternoon is 46 46 all right so uh let me see how can we do it uh we have uh eight people in the group 46 uh, we want groups of about uh 
Six, six people in a group, six eights are 48, right? Yes, yes, yes. And then add on one, one group will be nine, one group will be seven, others will be six. Are we last problem? Everyone look at the questions and see. We want to hear from you based on the purports and, and analogies verses 42 to 46. The relevance, first of all, of karma kandi division of the Vedas in the practice of Krishna consciousness. Discuss the relevance in relation to Krishna consciousness. And secondly, how are the practices of ISKCON authorized from Vedic point of view? Is it clear? Everyone? Can, you, yeah. Can you please elaborate uh, first question? I'm a little confused. Well, you have to read the verses. I want to know, is Karma Kandi practices, the section of Karma Kandi section of the Vedas, is it relevant for us in the practice of Krishna consciousness? Thank you, Maharaj. And then we want to know about the practices of ISKCON. Are they authorized from Vedic point of view? All right, we'll give you... How much time do you need? 10 minutes? 15 minutes. 15 minutes. No, no, no. Cannot give you 15 minutes. 10 minutes maximum. So break up into groups now, yes? Yes, Maharaj. Yeah. Okay, so we are we are in one group. No, we are actually uh, host co-hosts, so we we're not into any groups. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out. Is there is this one devotee, Radhisham Mataji. Yeah. Uh, Hare Krishna, Mataji. Radhisham Mataji. Radhisham Mataji, are you there? Okay. <laughs> We'll discuss here, uh, Prabhu, we have option to join into any of the rooms. If you actually go and click on breakout rooms, you can choose uh, any room and you can join there uh, if you want to be part of a bigger group. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's fine. Okay, so we have uh, seven and a half minutes then. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, discuss the relevance of Dharmakanda division of the Vedas. Okay, two, six. Yeah. So 
I'm looking at the verse 242 to 246. Um, so in So uh, one point I just uh, came across, basically it is not in that specific verse. It says that uh, basically all the rituals and sacrifices they do in the Karmakanda, basically it is to uplift the, you know, mm -hmm. the soul to the platform of self-realization. It is kind of a, like a, a ladder that will help the soul to elevate. Yeah. yeah, so this is this is one thing that I can think of as a relevance. Yeah, gradually elevate the general topic from introduction and graduation to the position of the transcendent. Absolutely, yeah. It's yeah. 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 yeah, I found this, uh, it is in 15.15 .15 Bhagavad Gita. Oh. It's, it's not in the verse that was out. It's there in 45th. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. Second one, should we go to the second one? Because, yes, yes. uh, I want to practice of this from here. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. is a part of this Veda in the Mahabharata, and uh, it, it is the uh, sense of all Vedic knowledge. Yeah, I'm also looking at the same point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I think that's quite uh, crispy, yeah, yeah, yeah. relevant to the point. I refer to this verse. Yeah. And plus, uh, as the 44th was explained, that uh, when there is a when Buddha is a continuous sense enjoyment, then there is a very less chance of a mind to be become a fix on a transcendental platform. So samadhi is never possible for us to impress you with material sense in garments. Yeah. Yourself. 
Okay, yeah. Uh, another one is uh, for the second one, but let me see how much time we got. Um, so for the second one, I, I'm, I'm also thinking another point is because uh, we are part of uh, Brahma Madhava Gaudi Sampradaya, so it is bona fide Sampradaya. I will also at this point we are we are following uh, Narada Pancharatrika with the SO for just to add some extra point. Hmm. So DT one shape and like that, right? Yeah. It's works. Where it makes sense? Oh no, it's not here. Okay, I think we should close now. Everybody get everyone back into the main room. Yes, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Yes, Hare Krishna. Maharaj. Yes, everyone's Krishna. all right. Everyone's back. Yeah, there's in four seconds here. Three, two, one. Yeah, just pause. All right. So we'd now like to hear first of all how you respond. Maybe one person, one person can give me their how they what they discussed and what they consider the relevance of the karma candid division of the Vedas is in the practice of Krishna Consciousness. So, Prahlad Prabhu, you are spokesperson of Vidru? Uh, rule number one. Okay. Manjari Mataji? Yes, Maharaj. Uh, in... Uh, in so, purpose... Mataji, you are your spokesperson of Vidru, so... Uh, we'll let you know. Okay, okay. So all those uh, questions are ready? Uh, yeah, I have written the points. So. Okay, okay. Just wait, Madhav. Let Pranath Prabhu speak first, then go. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Krishna Maharaj, so I'm, I am from Group 1. So uh, for the first question we discussed and we agreed that um, uh, karma under division of the Vedas is uh, it's meant to direct people to self-realization, as stated in uh, chapter 2, text 46. In the first part of the purport, it says that, Srila Prabhupada says that the karma kanda division of the Vedic literature is meant to encourage gradual development of self-realization. And then Prabhupada further mentions how self-realization is, the purpose of self-realization is to understand Lord Krishna as the primeval cause of everything and also to understand uh, one's eternal relationship with the Lord. So, okay, okay. Let's hear from another group. 
Let's hear from yes, group three. Uh, yes, uh, in uh, 43, 45, Vedas basically deal with the uh, protective activities, uh, but to gradually elevate to the general public from the sense gratification to the transcendental plane. So it is uh, relevant uh, because it is uh, going towards the transcendental plane. And uh, here also uh, in 46, Krishna, the relationship, uh, purport 46, first para, the relationship of the living entities with Krishna is also mentioned in uh, 15th chapter. 15.7, the living entities are the part and parcel and uh, the highest perfection stage of the Vedic knowledge is uh, also confirmed in Srimad Bhagavatam. Okay, Vedic okay, Vedic. thank you. Let's hear it. And uh, oh, yes? even Krishna is in 15. Uh, okay, now that's enough. I just want to know the first question, the first question about the relevance of Karmakanda. Some, someone else? Yes, Piyo Mataji. Hare Krishna Maharaj, in the verse 42 itself, it is says, such bodily happiness is certainly sensual. Therefore, those who are purely attached to such material, temporary happiness uh, as lords of the material world. It means that the people who are more attached to the materialistic things, Vedas, uh, you know, following Karamkandas and Vedas are for those kind of people. So is it relevant to the practice of Krishna consciousness? That's the uh, question. Not, Answer the yeah, question. If you, yeah, if you're only doing it for your sense uh, gratification and, you know, desiring materialistic things, then it is not. But if you're doing, like you're offering all the results to Krishna, then it is. So you should not be doing it for yourself, but for the Krishna. You're, you're saying you do karmakanda activities for Krishna? Offer the results. Do not be attached to the results of the activities, whatever you do. Well, I don't know what you're talking about. How you can do karmakanda activities and say it's for Krishna? As it any sort of activities, not uh, just karmakanda. All right, let's hear somebody else. Mangal Gopi Devi Dasi. Thank you, Krishna Maharaj. So, um, the relevance of the karmakanda in the practice of Krishna consciousness, I think, um, because I heard also that uh, the Vaisnava actually, um, um, you know, the beyond the three modes of mother, three modes of nature. So I think um, the devotees, I mean, we are not really doing karma kanda because otherwise it will produce another karma for us. That's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I hope, I hope we're not doing karma kanda. <laughs> yes, nice. Okay, anybody else there? Any other group? Yes. So I think our spokesman has already answered this question. Yes, we discussed that Karma Kanda section of uh, Vedas is gradual uh, process to attain self-realization. The goal is same, but Krishna consciousness is the direct process to attain the same goal. And also, uh, it is also mentioned in the Vedas because Upanishads are part of Vedas. So, Vedanta Sutra especially starts with Athato Brahma Jignasa. So, we have to inquire about the uh, self-realization, about the self. So, uh, Upan uh, Vedanta Sutra and Upanishad uh, point towards the devotional service of the Lord. And Upanishad especially uh, mentions the chanting of the holy name. So, uh, since we can't read all the Vedas in okay, the Okay, I wanted to know, you, you haven't answered the first question. So, it is not directly related to uh, Karma Kanda uh, as, uh, in the practice of Krishna consciousness. Okay, since thank you. Since we are not doing it. Right. Yeah. Thank you. That's the answer. That's what we want. It is not related to the practice of Krishna consciousness. Karmakanda division of the Vedas is not relevant to the practice of Krishna consciousness. This should be clear in everyone's mind. We, we don't practice Karmakandi 
activities. It's nothing to do with Krishna consciousness. You may say, oh, it's going to bring us to self-realization. There's no guarantee. But if people take immediately to Krishna consciousness, you know, do you think we're going to get people to do karma kandi activities first and then gradually make them devotees? No, never. No. They'll want to enjoy more. If they get results, if they get the results, karma kandi activities, they get material enjoyment, they want more. I didn't get enough enjoyment, I want more enjoyment. So the. It's not relevant to the practice of Krishna consciousness. This is important to understand. And so we have nothing to do with karma kandi activities. How are the practices of ISKCON authorized from Vedic point of view? That's the second question. And so Madhiji, you can continue. What was your answer to this? Yes, so ISKCON uh, follows chanting of the holy name and devotional service. So devotional service is ma mentioned in Vedanta Sutra as well as Upanishads. And uh, since the age, uh, lifespan is very short in this age uh, and people are more uh, bewildered and uh, quarrelsome, it's, uh, it's the easiest process mentioned in Upanishads to chant the holy name and attain the same goal which is attained by Karmakanda. And since Upanishads are part of Vedas, it is uh, it is authorized uh, process, what uh, ISKCON practice is from the Vedic point of view. Yes, right. We have Prabhupada writes in the purport of 46, text 46 in the purport, Prabhupada talks about we have to understand the purpose behind the Vedas. Right? Krishna says, by all the Vedas I am to be known. So what the, the purpose behind the Vedas is to know Krishna and to become the servant of Krishna, to do service to Krishna. The chanting of the holy name is an authorized process from the, from the Vedic. It's a Vedic mantra, the chanting of the holy names is a Vedic process. So this is authorized. From, and the purport Prabhupada quotes a verse from Kapila Shiksha, a whole buck, a whole buck, a whole right? That, uh, that one can practice, uh, if one is chanting the holy names of the Lord, it's understood that in his previous life, he's already studied all the Vedas, he's already visited all the holy places, he's already performed all rituals and austerities and acquired all the good qualities of the Aryans. And that's why he's able to constantly chant the holy name of Krishna. So the chanting of the holy name is authorized from the Vedic point of view. Is this all clear to everyone? Any questions? Okay, we'll go ahead. The highest Vedantist the best purpose of Vedanta philosophy is served by inoffensively chanting the holy name of the Lord. The highest Vedantist is the great soul who takes pleasure in chanting the holy name of the Lord. So pure chanting of the holy name, that's important. And we should take pleasure in the chanting of the holy name. Srila Prabhupada teaches us all of these things. Okay, we're going to go ahead. Buddhi yoga, karma yoga, sankhya, jnana. Thus far, I have described this knowledge to you through analytical study. Analytical study means sankhya. So this jnana, this has been described through analytical study, sankhya. And buddhi yoga, karma yoga. Now listen as I explain it in terms of working without fruitive results, O son of Prita. When you act in such knowledge, you can free yourself from the bondage of works. 
when you work, when you act in such knowledge, so that's buddhi yoga, you have your proper knowledge, then you free yourself from the bondage of works. Working without fruitive result, right? That is karma yoga, working without fruitive result. We perform our duty in a detached manner. Karma yogi, he will do his duty, but in a, he's a detached from the result. He's not working just simply for his own enjoyment. Described here, text number 38. Someone can read for us? Yes, we have to read. Sukha Dukhe Sama Kritwa Sukha Dukhe Sama Haribur Prabhu, please raise your hand and then speak. Go ahead, Madhiji. Sukha Dukhe Sama Kritwa Labha Labha Jaya Jaya Tato Yudhaya Yudha Yudhaswa Naivam Papa Mahapya Sakyasi Do thou fight for the sake of fighting without considering happiness or distress, loss or gain, victory or defeat, and by so doing, you shall never incur sin. Bhagavad Gita 2.38. Thank you. So, fight for the sake of fighting. It's your duty. Don't consider the result. Don't consider happiness or distress, loss or gain, victory or defeat. In other words, do your fighting in a detached manner. By so doing, you shall never incur sin. So that is the nature of karma yoga. Yeah, go ahead, Maharaji, read. Hare Krishna, uh, this is duty. One has to execute duty without any concentration of loss and gain. This is duty. Observing duty, just see, you are akshat, you are kshatriya. This is necessity of this fighting. So you should not consider whether you are gaining or losing. It is your duty to fight. If you execute your duty nicely, there is no question of sin. To execute duty is fight, Paiti. Bhagavad Gita 2.27 to 38, Los Angeles, December 11, 1968. Thank you. This is duty. Kshatriya's duty is fighting. D different varnas will have different duties. Somebody is a Brahman. His duty is to recite the Vedas. His duty is to, to preach, uh, to chant the holy name, to worship the deities, like that. The Vaishya's duty to protect the cows. And the Sudra's duty to serve. So, Karma Yoga, it means working in a detached way. So perform your duty nicely. Although you should be detached from the result, still we should try to the, perform the duty as nice as possible. And so that's difficult for people. That's a challenge. If we think, if we think I'm getting the result, then we'll try very hard. But if we think I'm not getting the result, no, well, why should I care? So, to perform our duty properly, we should perform the duty as best we can, to the best of our ability. Then that is piety. Here's the interesting verse in this regard. Well-known verse, very famous verse, often quoted by people in India. They love this verse. They like this verse very much, right? Karmani Vadikaraste, right? Arjuna's eligibility, his adhikar, his adhikar is for karma. His adhikar is for work. He's, he's eligible to work, but he's saying he doesn't want to fight, doesn't want to work. 
Karmani ev adhikaraste mapaleshu kadachana. But, you see, people like this first part of the verse, Arjuna's eligibility is to work. But the second part of the verse, they don't like this part so much. Mapali Shukadachana. You are not entitled to the fruit. Right? Can you understand? Why would people like to quote the first part of the verse and not the second part? Anybody like to respond to this? Have you ever preached about this? This verse? Yeah, it, it takes a lot of detachment to be, you know, not thinking about the results or not worrying about the results, leaving it to Krishna. So it's, it's very difficult to... Yes, really, isn't it? We even have a saying, we have a saying in English, I don't know if you have it in India, but the saying in English is, proprietorship can turn sand into gold. You know, if you, if you own something, if something is yours, then even if it's, it's just sand, you'll value it just like it's gold. But if something is not yours, you're, you know, in other words, we say detached, the result is not yours. <laughs> we don't value so much. Have, have, you, have you met people who, ever, who, who talk like this? They, they, you know, they like this verse. Karmani eva discarded. How will they take it? How will they interpret this verse? What will it, they tend to do? Anyone can tell us? Yes, Nitya Sarupanu. Actually, this verse was Karmani Vadi Usually, you're taken as work is worship. We have to work and we can go to any extent to work, uh, but that is result-oriented work only. So usually uh, people justify uh, whatever they are doing is because Krishna has mentioned in this verse. Yes, right. Yeah, good. Very good. Yes. They say, Krishna says, I have a right to do my work. <laughs> Krishna said, I have a right to do my business, I have a right to work, I have to do my work. But do they ever quote the second part of the verse? Mapali Shu Kadachana. No, very, very rare. Someone will say, you're not entitled to the fruit. But as Mariji said, people say, oh, work is worship, work is, I have to work. Krishna says we have to work. Yes, we do all, we do have to work. But, ma pali shu kadachana, you are not entitled to the fruit. And then Krishna goes on to say, never consider yourself to be the cause of the results and never be attached to not performing your duty. So, it's a very important verse, and we should be familiar with this, and we should note how people can misinterpret it, how they can give it some other understanding. They, can, they just take the first part of the verse. And they never think about the second part. No, I have a right to work. But <laughs> ask them, you know, all, all right, you have to work, you know, you have to give the fruit of your work to Krishna. What? No, no, I have to, the fruit, that's for me, I work. They don't want to do that. Mm. So, here, the Lord says, you cannot stop your work, neither you can enjoy the activities, the fruit of your activities. That is the work on spiritual plane. So, work on the spiritual plane means you work for Krishna. You don't enjoy the you don't enjoy the fruit of the activities. You cannot stop work. Neither you can enjoy the activities. We can, of course, we can enjoy, we may enjoy working for Krishna, 
But we have to remember the fruit is to be given to Krishna. So that is work on the spiritual plane. So Lord Krishna is encouraging Arjuna to perform his work in that manner. As buddhi yoga, understanding that he's working for the pleasure of the Supreme Lord, not for his own satisfaction. Yes, someone please read. Yogasta Kuru Karmani Sangam Tyatva Dananjaya Siddhya Siddhyo Samubhutva Samatvam Yoga Uchate Perform your duty, equipoised, O Arjuna, abandoning all attachment to success or failure. Such equanimity is called Yoga. Bhagavad Gita 2.48 Again, you can see what is being described in this verse. Buddhi yoga or karma yoga, detached work, perform your duty at the same time giving up all attachment to the results. Such equanimity is called yoga. And what kind of yoga? This is called buddhi yoga or karma yoga. where you perform your duty without attachment to the result. This is not bhakti yoga. Not bhakti yoga hasn't been described in these verses. Is someone read? Lord Krishna now directly says that Arjuna should fight for the sake of fighting because he desires the battle that is the indirect hint given by Krishna to Arjuna in this verse. 2.38 purport. Indirectly, Arjuna was advised to act as Krishna told him. 2.48 purport. Uh -huh. So, from the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita, although we're, Lord Krishna has just began to give instructions, so he, he's giving indirect hints. He hasn't openly told Arjuna, you have to fight, you have to do this. But he's giving indirect indications to Arjuna that he should do it. He's talking about karma yoga, he's describing, do the duty. In this way, he was removing Arjuna's uh, reason for not fighting. Remember, Arjuna was worried about sinful reactions. So Krishna is responding to this. And at the same time, he's, in, he, he's indicating to Arjuna that actually you should be fighting, you should be doing this. Arjuna was advised to act as Krishna told him, indirectly. All right, so compassion was defeated by knowledge of the soul. And then we heard enjoyment, the Arjuna's desire to enjoy will be there if he fights. If he doesn't fight, he won't enjoy. And so this was explained by Krishna presenting the philosophy of Karmakanda. And then sinful reactions. Arjuna is naturally worried about the sinful reactions which he would incur from fighting, killing, and injuring people. We'd get sinful reactions. But Lord Krishna has explained to him, well, if you are fighting as karma yoga or buddhi yoga, you're doing your duty and you perform your duty with, with a, in a detached manner, then there's no sinful reactions. So in this way, Lord Krishna has defeated Arjuna's reasons for not fighting. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, someone like to read here for us? Hare Krishna, overview of Bhagavad Gita chapter 2. Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakura has summarized this second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita as being the contents of the whole text. In the Bhagavad Gita, the subject matters are Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga and Bhakti Yoga. 
In the second chapter, Karma Yoga and Jnana Yoga have been clearly discussed and a glimpse of Bhakti Yoga has also been given as the contents per complete text. 2.72 per word. Yes, right. So Prabhupada has given the title for the second chapter as the contents of the Gita summarized because the, the main philosophies are explained briefly. Karma Yoga and Jnana Yoga in more detail and Bhakti Yoga, a little glimpse of Bhakti Yoga. Mm -hmm. So in the second chapter you can see uh, the main sections of the second chapter began with Arjuna surrendering to Krishna. Arjuna was confused about his duty and he took that advantage of Lord Krishna's presence to su surrender himself and ask Lord Krishna to instruct him. And in this way Lord Krishna presented philosophy of the, the soul, the knowledge of the soul to defeat compassion, then knowledge of karma kanda, and then also buddhi yoga, karma yoga. And at the end of the chapter, we'll hear about the stita dir muni, stita dir muni, one who's uh, restraining the senses, controlling the senses. We'll hear more about that in the next class. We haven't explained that yet, but we'll be coming to that. It comes up. We have another exercise for you to do. How many people? 46, is it? Yes, Maharaj. So can we make pairs? Can you put devotees in pairs? That will be like 23 pairs. Yes, sure, Maharaj. Maharaj, I have a question. Okay. Oh, yes, you have a question? Yeah, so Prabhupada uh, mentioned somewhere I read in purport that uh, Bhutti Yoga is uh, is uh, Bhakti Yoga and he quotes uh, um, 10th chapter in it. So, but, um, so is it Karma Yoga or is it Bhakti Yoga by Bhutti Yoga? What do we have to understand? Well, it's not totally Bhakti Yoga, Bhutti Yoga. But it's, it's coming to Bhakti Yoga. It's on the yoga ladder. Okay. So it's coming to Bhakti Yoga. The Buddhi Yoga is on a lower level than the Bhakti Yoga. Bhakti Yoga okay. is the top. But the Buddhi Yoga is part of the yoga process and it will gradually bring one Karma Yoga and Buddhi Yoga, they're very similar to each other. Uh, the difference being with Karma Yoga and Buddhi Yoga and Bhakti Yoga is that people are attached to work. They want to work in a particular way, performing their duty. Like we said, Arjuna has to perform a duty. And so in, Buddhi, in Bhakti Yoga, one is just surrendered and he will do anything for Krishna. But in Karma Yoga or Buddhi Yoga, there's a sense of duty and, you know, according to their situation in Varnashram, they're going to work in a particular way, they're, but they're going to work in a detached manner and they will offer the results of their work to Krishna. But in Bhakti Yoga, the, the devotee will do anything for Krishna. And he surrendered to Krishna in the beginning. It's not that he, he works and then gives, then offers to Krishna, but he surrenders in the very beginning to Krishna. Karma Yogi is thinking, I'm giving this to Krishna. But the, Buddha, the Bhakti Yoga, and the Bhakti Yogi, he understands everything is Krishna's. Nothing is mine. So subtle distinction there. And the Buddha yogi and the, the karma yogi, they're working and then they surrender. But the bhakti yogi, he surrenders first. And everything is Krishna's. Okay, Maharaj. 
Thank you. So, so in some of the verses, for example, you'll notice the word is buddhi yoga or karma yoga, and Prabhupada would simply translate it as bhakti yoga, or he will translate them as devotee. You know, Prabhupada won't make a distinction. And it's interesting because uh, Burijan Prabhu, he makes the point that many devotees, many of us are actually, we're on the level more of buddhi yogi than, or karma yogi rather than bhakti yogi. To get people to actually do full bhakti is quite challenging for a lot of devotees. But for most people, it's they're more on that level of karma and buddhi yoga. So Prabhupada doesn't make a distinction between these different types of people in his translation and purports. And you'll see the word in Sanskrit is often buddhi yoga or bhakti yoga, and Prabhupada will just translate it as bhakti yoga. Yeah, so in Krishna consciousness or devotional service, we do the similar thing, right? We do the same thing that we don't, uh, we work for Krishna, we do the same activities. If uh, like there are grihasthas, they do the same activities which other people are doing. Oh, yeah. But yes. in their mind, they, are, uh, they know that it is for Krishna. So. Right, yes. And they offer the results. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, everyone's devotee, and you know, maybe you could say we're mixed devotees, we're maybe like karma mishra bhaktas or something, you know. Our devotion is mixed with some desire for karma. Mm, you know, we're, we're not, we can't, it's not easy to come to that level of being a pure bhakti, uh, shuddha bhakta, but you know, some, often our devotion is mixed with desire for fruitive work. Right, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you for the question. All right, so here's the exercise for the pairs. We want you to look at these two verses. Uh, first of all, 240, pratyavayo navidyate, and then vayavas ayatmika buddhi, text 41. So, we want just each pair to take one verse. So maybe group one to ten, we'll take uh, group one, we'll take 240. And then the other groups, you know, groups 11 to 20 or whatever, they'll take group two, Vaya Vasayatmika Buddhi, 240. So read purport and discuss the significance. We don't have a lot of time, so can you begin? Yes, it's Pavinas Prabhu. So one to ten groups will focus on uh, first that, part and yeah, two forty. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, Maharaj. <coughs> Are we going to sit for ten minutes? No, Maharaj? five five minutes only. Thank you. Okay, I'm setting up the rooms. We are ready to go now. Okay.
Okay. Do you know which group you're a part of? Uh, 14. Okay. Okay, so we got three minutes, Prabhu. Yeah, we can discuss what time we have. Yeah, um, so should we take 240 or 51? Let's take 240. Make a big thing. Pratava, you're not with your taste. So come up, yes, the door, Monsieur, try it, Mahato, by it. Translation and purpose is by his divine grace, his bhakti with the Swami Sri Lopalupada Kijaya. The center where there is no loss or denomination or little advancement on this path can protect one from the most dangerous type of fear. Um, Prabhu, I'm reading it myself, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good. Krishna counts. It's nice. Got thirty seconds. Yes. So in essence, uh, there is no loss in Krishna consciousness. Yes. Sir. Yeah. So material activities and their results end with the body, but working in Krishna consciousness, uh, yeah, there is no loss, loss even yeah. after this body. Yeah. Loss. Okay. Um, I'll see if this is going to get close immediately, the breakout rooms. Um, just give me a minute. Yes, we can close everything now, bring everyone back. Yes, Maharaj.
Yes. <coughs> Is everyone back in the room? Yes, ma'am. Almost. All right, so let's hear some response to the first one. Pratnyabhaya navidyate, Bhagavad Gita 240. What's the significance? Yes, Yes, go ahead, Prabhu. Sunanda Prabhu, are you from the group one? The group one uh, that Prabhavati Na Vidyati, that is in the text uh, uh, 40 of chapter 2, that here Krishna says that in this endeavor there is no loss or de de diminution and a little and advancement on this part can protect one from the most dangerous type of fear. So here Krishna describes that uh, uh, whatever we, ha we, ha uh, we, we do for Krishna, that is for eternal, that is our eternal activity. And it cannot be destroyed by the time factor. The relationship between uh, the Krishna a little bit, even a little bit, we, we work for Krishna's satisfaction that consciousness cannot be destroyed by the time factor. So here Krishna says that uh, there is no loss for this, uh, this type of uh, uh, work which is satisfying Krishna. So Krishna uh, tells us that here uh, he, he gives us example that we have to work for him without a, without a, um, uh, without a, uh, result oriented we have to only only our motto is to satisfy krishna with our work whether it is good or bad it doesn't matter in krishna consciousness in the absolute form good or bad is, we are above all good or bad so here krishna says that whatever you do for me for my satisfaction there is no loss and the time factor cannot destroy it. Okay, thank yes, you. Th Radha. Thank you. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you very much. Yes. So there's no loss or diminution. Whatever we do, of course, that's on the spiritual platform. You know, we could say someone may say, Well, I lost my time, I lost my energy, I lost a lot of uh, the years of my life doing this work for Krishna, but it's, it's not a loss. The benefit is, of course, it goes into our spiritual bank account. Now the spiritual bank account is different from the material bank account. The material bank account, you know, money's always going down. We spend the money and it gets down and down, less and less. But the, the spiritual bank account, the more we are doing service for Krishna, then that, that benefit is there, it's to our credit. And, and it, will, it will help us particularly at the end of life, when we have to give up this body, they'll look at our spiritual bank account and see how much has this person done for Krishna? What have they actually done? How much have they contributed to Krishna? And then that will help us in our next life to go on in our service to Krishna. So this is the significance here. All right. And then group number two. Someone. 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 Hi, Prabhu. Are you from group two? Prabhu. Prabhu, what I believe is that uh, over here uh, Krishna is trying to say that in, my, in spiritual activities there is no loss to gain. If you do 5% today in this birth... No, 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 we want 241. No, I am from the group 2, someone my group. I am group 2. Okay. I am sitting. Uh, uh, so in group 2, uh, it's mentioned that we are Vashayatmi Kadurdi. So one who is uh, resolute in Krishna consciousness, uh, that means the 
uh, intelligence is fixed. When does the intelligence become fixed? Uh, when there is no chance for sense gratification, not even a tinge of attraction to improve your activities. And Gopal used to often quote this verse uh, saying that uh, I took the order of my spiritual master uh, that I should go to the Western country uh, and to preach. Uh, that was my life and soul. So he used to mention this. Uh, so there is uh, uh, no uh, other branch uh, rather than uh, taking the order of the spiritual uh, master. And that comes uh, when the intelligence is uh, fixed. Yes. There is yes, very good. Thank you very much. That's very nice. That the order of the spiritual master becomes the life and soul of the disciple and his very fixed, very resolute determination to follow that instruction out. Thank you very much. So these two verses, very important, and uh, they help us to understand more the contents of the Bhagavad Gita. So just to see what we covered today, we had a look at Krishna's instructions on knowledge from text 11 to 30, the nature of the soul being eternal and the body temporary. Then we, we explain Krishna's response to Arjuna's, the first three reasons for not fighting, compassion, enjoyment, sinful reactions. Krishna defeated them. And we also had the summary of the Bhagavad Gita, explaining how the chapter 2 of Bhagavad Gita summarizes the contents of the Gita. We spoke about the relevance of Karmakanda, of the Vedas, and we said it's not relevant in the practice of Krishna consciousness. But Veda, the chanting of Hare Krishna, that is very important, and that is authorized by the Vedas. And then we spoke about the appropriate and inappropriate application of this verse, karmani vadikaraste, important, Often quoted, Karmani Evadit Karaste, people like to think, I'm working for Krishna, but they don't quote the second part of the verse. They only quote the first part. And just now we've heard about the significance of these two verses, uh, Pratyavayo Navidyate and Vaya Vasayatmika Bhutti. So, by way of conclusion, Bhogaishwarya Prasaptanam Taya Parita Chaitasam. This material advancement of civilization, very nice, very dazzling. Just like when we pass on the street or the road of your American cities, it looks so nice. So many lights and so many night illuminating signboards. But we should always remember that this nice situation is not permanent settlement. Any moment I'll have to give up everything. So therefore, if one becomes attached to this false platform, illuminating, so-called illuminating false platform, then his determination to go back to Godhead will not be very much intense. This is a problem. If we become bewildered or enamored, overly attracted by these material things, then it will be very difficult for us to go back to Godhead. Exactly. All right. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Jai. Are there any questions? <laughs> They have to be important questions, you know. Okay, Krishna Maharaj, I have a question um, in, uh, in relation to um, uh, the verse 40. Yeah. Um, where, benefit, where benefits about Krishna, you know, any activities done, we don't have any uh, diminutions, it's never lost. Yes. But I've also been told that. Um, Whenever, if we do Vaishnava Aparat, all our spiritual benefits, it's all like destroyed and it's all stopped and all. Well, if you do Vaishnava Aparat, then your devotional service is suspended. But you don't lose what you've done. But 
it stops. It can be suspended, just like, you know, you're playing soccer and you may get sent off. So you may get suspended for some matches, you don't get to play. And so similarly, your devotional service may be suspended because of Vaishnav Aparad. But you don't lose it. If you do, you've done something after some time, you again will, can come back, take it up. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Any other question? Okay, we're going to go on next weekend to chapter 3. And of course, we have to speak also about the Stita Dir Muni. We'll hear about that. So you can look over that and prepare for next weekend. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Krishna. Krishna. <laughs> 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 <laughs>